Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Azari. I'm the president of this club, and I am moderator of this uh, event. Uh, and uh, our guest speaker today is uh, Dr. Khalil Hassan. He is uh, ambassador of the uh, Kingdom of Bahrain in Tokyo. And uh, he is the first ambassador and, uh, uh, of Bahrain to Japan. Uh, he as assumed his post. Uh, in, 19, in 2005. And in 2002, he became Minister of Health after having been elected President of the Bahrain Medical Association. So Dr. Hassan has uh, uh, experience in being a doctor and medical uh, uh, in, the, in the medical field, uh, it's not only in the diplomatic field. And also, before that, uh, he had been an associate professor of surgery at the Arabian Gulf University in Bahrain. And in 1974, he served as a medical doctor at the Royal in Infirmary of Edinburgh in UK. And in 1978, he was a pediatric surgeon at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in UK, uh, York Hill. And he has uh, also been awarded uh, the honor of merit first class by His Majesty the King of Bahrain. And uh, Dr. Hassan has been an uh, active member of our club. He attends most of our meetings and he participates in the questions, giving a lot of insights. And today, uh, today press conference will be about uh, the future of the Middle East, this is the most difficult question in the planet, I think, has been always difficult to uh, find what's going on there and what's the uh, track of events taking us to. And uh, the event today will be for uh, about one hour, able to be extended, and uh, it will start for half an hour, and it, it will be followed by questions and answers. Without, without further ado, Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome our guest speaker today, Dr. Khalil Hassan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm honored to be here. And thank you for coming. Let's start. Let's see how we can answer this question. These are the issues I'd like to discuss. Please remember that the strategic geography of the Middle East and the large energy reserves can you imagine this was Middle East 7,000 years back? A lot of things been invented at that time. Now, if you look at history, history of Middle East goes back from Mesopotamia and Egypt pharaohs to Persian Empire, to Greek Empire, to Roman Empire, <coughs> to two period of Islamic you know, Islamic Empire and Ottoman Empire. It's almost 1,500 years. That's why Professor Karish called it Islamic imperialism. <clears throat> now, this is Ottoman Empire 1914. It's shrunk. By 1922, there was no Ottoman Empire anymore. And important, from 1916 to 2016, there was evolution in the Middle East in many uh, areas. The first, this was, you know, the region before Sykes-Picot. And see what happened. Completely changed. There are states before there were no states. It was just Ottoman Empire. Now, the other important point, with these changes, there was changes in politics and political parties, evolution. Many different parties came, you know, nationalism, socialism, Islamism, and we see how these again evolve in the future, and we'll discuss this later on. Other issue was important is, you know, the Jewish people, they suffered in their uh, history, and there was clear that they need some solution. And Theodor Herzl thought the best thing that the Jewish people have their own states. Uh, Herzl died in 1904, before he achieved. He worked very hard for the uh, Jewish state, but he died before he achieved anything. I, had, I think he had a heart attack. 
In September 1917, a British ambassador to France received a proposal from Dr. M. L. Rothstein, Paris-based Russian Jew. He was proposing to Arthur Belfort that Antoinette Power should equip and organize army from Bahrain for the conquest of Al-Ihsa for creation of Jewish state on the Persian Gulf. That was the, the thought at that time. Belfort refused that idea. And for many reasons, there's no time to discuss this just now. But by November 1917, establishment in Palestine, a national home for the Jewish people. In 1948, Israel was established. And new challenges added in the Middle East challenges. The other challenge which came to the Middle East is microchip evolution, transportation, telecommunication, changed the world to small, a global village, but we had the globalization challenge. And see how the globalization challenges affected the world and affected the Middle East. How did it affect the governance? This is a very interesting book for uh, the diplomat, Professor Kishore Mahbubani. He wrote, before human nation were like a flotilla of more than 100 separate boats, the world needed a set of rules to prevent coalition and enhance co cooperation in the high seas. He continued, today, seven billions live in the same ship. The problem is that these nations have 193 captains and each claiming exclusive responsibility for one cabin. However, it has no captain to take care of the ship as a whole. In conclusion, there's no global leaders to deal with the global changes in the world. Again, foreign policy changed by globalization. Lord David Howell, he wrote, the communication revolution is robbing government of their age-old monopoly of foreign policy making. The concept of a world shaped by transformation diplomacy of American value now has zero validity. How come? You know, United States spend a lot on uh, defense. Let's see his answer. The answer lies in one word, microchip. Size no longer equated power. On the contrary, size means vulnerability, slowness to ad adapt, and inflexibility. The miniaturization of the weaponry combined with the communication revolution has given birth to a reversible asymmetry of warfare. And he concluded, this power is in the reach of the smallest extremist group. And that's our problem today. Economics, again, globalization changed e economics because you need now global economics. And to do that, there was a deregulation, a global flea market. But unfortunately, there were challenges. And we ended with crisis of 2008, financial crisis. Now, with this crisis, inequality increased. And we start talking about the one person and 99 person. Unfortunately, this inequality is not only in the East, also in the West. And it's rising. And unfortunately, it's associated with political polarization. And that's what, what we see today. OK, what did inequality do to Arab world? And what did it do to Arab Spring? Let's look at Tunisia before Arab Spring. Now, we look at these two curves. One is about GDP. The other is how people are thriving. 2008, the GDP per capita was in, in Tunisia 7,182. By 2010, it's rise to 9,489. Let's look at thriving. In 2008, 24% of the people said they are thriving. 
the rest they were suffering or staggering with life. By 2010, that reduced to 14%. Only 14% who said they are thriving. How come the GDP is going up and people thriving is going down? And that shows you that the wealth is concentrated in the hand of you. The others are getting poorer. And that was just before Arab Spring in Tunisia. The other question is, is it really we call it Arab Spring? Is it Arab Spring? Let's see Joseph Stiglitz, what he says. A youth uprising that began in Tunisia, soon the people in Spain, Greece, UK, and US, and other countries around the world had their own reason to be on the street. The protesters were right. The gap between what our economics and political system are supposed to do and what they were actually doing became too large to be ignored. He concluded, free market proved inefficient with its deregulation. For that, we have now a challenge in our global, our global world. Now, let's look at post-Arab Spring. Do we have to review our global diplomacy and foreign policy? Do we know who is ISIS? Why a human brain change from empathetic brain to reptile brain? Professor Richard Sharon, New York University, he was asking why youth in Europe go and join with ISIS? And he found the answer in the writing of German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. He wrote, human would rather will meaning nothingness, let me repeat, human would rather will nothingness than not will anything, hopelessness and extremism. The despair of lifelessness, impotence and hopelessness is vastly less appealing than the intensity of violence, death, and destruction. A growing disparity in educational and economical opportunity are breeding hopelessness and extremism. Let's look at the psychology of this. Please remember that human being made from two half cells, a sperm which pierces the ovum and form a complete cell. And the cells start dividing and form the embryo and the fetus and different organ will develop. And one important organ is the brain. If we look at the brain cell, it's very complicated cell. There are a lot of wiring. And if we look how this brain cell is controlled, there's in the center a nucleus. In this nucleus, there is what we call chromosome. And these chromosomes are made from genes. And these genes are made from a compound we call DNA. And the DNA has all the codes for how the cell will function. And the question is, can environment change genes to change brain structure and function? To answer this question, please remember that human brain evolved over hundred millions of years. For that, our brain has three parts. The first part is the reptile brain. The same part we have, the reptile they have. And <coughs> this is what we call a reptile brain, a survival brain. Over this, the other part, we call it a mammal brain, uh, which the mammal has and we have it. It's related to the emotion. And the third is the reasoning brain. Usually, a human being has this part of the brain. And the question is, can brain development reverse from reasoning brain to mammal brain to reptile brain? Research shows the answer, yes. Imagine a brain is supercomputer and has 100 billion of super chips. A neuron number almost complete just before birth and brain cells, neuron brain cells. Other brain has hundreds of trillion of our connection. 
But most of these connections happen after birth. Education, training, and life experience will decide integrity of this connection and brain functional development. Wrong edu education, life experience, reproduce a reptile brain. Let's look at another question of globalization. Is Western democracy evolving? And let's take the best, a good example of Western democracy, UK. A British government spending increased from 13% of GDP in 1913 to 48% in 2011, while we are talking about smaller government. Less than 1% of the population are member of politic, political parties. Tories declined from 3 million, imagine 3 million in 1950, to 134,000 today. That shows you it's not on, uh, only in Britain, all around the world. Things are changing completely. And the question is, do we need to reinvent politics, economics, governance, and democracy? This is an interesting book written by the former editors of the Economist mag uh, magazine. The Fourth Revolution, the Global Race to Reinvent the State. They wrote, modern politicians are like architects arguing about the condition of individual room in a crumbling house, rushing to fix a window without ever considering the design of the whole building. We need, they concluded, we need to look at the design of a whole structure and also think about the proper role of the state in fast-changing global society. Now, in this book, they discuss how should the state be changed. First, pragmatism, improving government management and harnessing technology, smart, innovative government. Government should work like a global, efficient, intelligent company. Polit political principle, politics out of the state management. I attended a very interesting uh, conference two weeks ago, and I learned a lot. World Marketing Summit. Imagine what the business marketing expert discussing these days. Rethinking business in the time of overwhelming change. Before, they had model one for marketing, which discussed profit. Now they have model four, uh, three, and they are discussing model four for marketing, which discuss spirit, value, happiness. Can you imagine this evolution? They are discussing balance, seeing purpose and profit. They are discussing cycle of goodness. No one prospers without rendering the benefit to others. They are discussing collective prosperity. I was astonished. Again, in their journal, they asked this question, are we going to shift from one person world to three zero global wise civilization? Zero poverty, zero <laughs> unemployment, zero uh, carbon emission. Let's look at post-Arab Spring. This is an interesting bo book. Uh, one of the BBC reporter, Paul Danahar, wrote, nothing expressed the profound shock caused by the collapse of old order in Middle East more clearly than the confused and dithering of the outside world to the war in Syria. It simply did not know what to do. He concluded, con he continued, there is a renewable, renewed, violent power struggle between Sunni and Shia Islam. There's also a growing religious divide in Israel. Yet, uprising were not Islamic revolution. 
Voter wanted answer to problems like unemployment, an inadequate uh, education system, and poor health care. He continued, the Arab world is trying to find their way from dictatorship to democracy. <clears throat> Again, this is a very important book, uh, uh, thing he mentioned. He said, we in the West, we need to understand this region. What happened in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. And that in costing us significant in the term of both blood and treasure. And this is very important, we'll come back to this later on. He continued, Arab, Arab Spring has forced Arab people to re-examine their identity and decide what role their faith will play in their life and their policies. It has made the West also look at its conscience as it rebuilt foreign policies for the region. Again, important point. How to build a new global foreign policy? Are we going to abandon cowboy diplomacy, an eye for an eye? An eye for an eye make the whole world blind, Mahatma Gandhi. Do we need global diplomat? Do we need diplomat who have the conscience of saint, the wisdom of philosopher, and the prescience of prophet? Who understand that foreign policy should blend realism with idealism, placing morality in the center of our foreign policy? That's been said by Madeleine Albright. Middle East challenges, population growth, young population, labor force growth, high unemployment, high inequality, huge gap in the GDP between different countries. Other challenges, failed states, Kurdish dilemma, radical Islam, theocracy, and new geopolitical forces. At the same time, there are opportunities in the Middle East. Love for freedom. Most of the Middle East people, they believe in freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Most of the Middle East, they believe advisory role of the religion. Again, there's a history of harmony in the Middle East. Karen Armstrong, British historian, she wrote in Andalusia, Christian, Jewish, Muslim people lived in relative harmony for 500 years. Ori, uh, Ori Avenari, Israeli journalist, wrote, Christian, Jewish, Muslim scholar translated together the ancient Greek philosophical scientific <laughs> text that was indeed the golden age. Love for peace, education, technology. <coughs> Again, population can be opportunity. Increasing young population and labor force might be an engine for economic growth and prosperity. Reduced oil prices can be an area for efficiency. Again, there can be innovative diplomacy. A professor, Dominique Mossi, Paris professor, his father was a survivor of the Holocaust. He wrote, you know, suggesting that it's easy to have a joint market between Jordan, Palestine, and Israeli. And maybe in later stage have a confederation. Again, there are many good ideas for the youth in the Middle East, marketing beyond product. 20th century, it was about products. 21st century is about beyond products. For example, Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. Airbnb, the largest accommodation provider on no real estate. Uber, world's largest taxi company, has no fleet. Facebook, the most popular media owner, created no content. But there are many ideas if just with a little bit of education and a little bit of hopelessness. Hope. Again, it's the age of formation, democratization. There are many ways that the youth can be powerful and express their views. 
through many internet sites, by God, e-good, open label, good guy. The Middle East future, this is an important slide, there's no time to explain, but uh, the Middle East is a time like the end of Western Europe, uh, you know, end of the World War II in Europe. And I try to explain. Foreign affair, post-American Middle East, Professor Daniel Byman wrote, Fighting tourists require not just preventing next 1911, but also navigating civil wars, stopping conflict before they break out, containing the ones that do, and building state capacity. This is important. The goal, to, uh, goal of state building should not be democracy promotion, but conflict resolution. He concluded, before institution fully developed effort to hold election may backfire, polarizing the public. Professor Jeffrey Sack, Columbia University, he wrote, the region political institution has been crippled as a result of repeated US and European intervention dating back to World War I. One century is enough. The year to 2016 should mark the start of a new century, the homegrown Middle Eastern politics focus urgently on the challenge of sustainable development. Everybody wants sustainable development for Middle East. Let's see how Islamists are revol uh, evolving. Uh, if you remember, Arab Spring ended with the government of Islamists in Tunisia. Rashid al Ghanoushi, he is the co founder of a Nahda party, sort of brotherhood Islamists. They wrote, they had a meeting this year, the party, and he wrote in this month for an affair. Imagine how things are changing, evolving. He wrote from political Islam to Muslim democracy. Our, he said, our objective to separate the political and religious field. All their life, they are mixing these together. Now they want to separate them. We believe that no political party can or should claim to represent, uh, represent religion and that the religious sphere should be managed by independent and neutral institution before they were representing religion. Imagine how much revolution is there, evolution. Again, he concluded, we also agreeing that constitution would not cite Sharia law as one of the source of legislation. Imagine all these decades they're talking included. Now they say no, it should not include it. Conclusion. The Middle East is vital for healthy global economy and security. The Middle East is globally important, strategically and economically. The Middle East government and oil company might be more efficient and innovative after recent crisis. The Middle East need advanced technology and education. The Middle East can benefit from, benefit from the age of information democratization. And the last slide, this is very important, the answer to this question, because this is what will decide the future of Middle East. Is this glass empty or is it full? Is it half full or half empty? Or technically the glass is always full, half air and half water. And I think the best is this wisdom. One day someone showed me a glass of water that was half full and he said, is it half full or half empty? So I drank the water no more problems. If you have opportunity, grab it and continue reforming. Thank you. Domo arigato very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have a lot of air in the class here <laughs> and in the room. So the air is very important. Yes. <laughs> Nobody noticed this before.
Uh, I would like to open the floor for questions and answers. Please, if you have any question, raise your hand and proceed to the front mic and say your name and uh, affiliation. Ahmad. Thank you, Excellency. My name is Imad Ajami, Iris Media. I learn a lot from your impressive lecture. I came from Middle, Middle East, but you teach me a lot. In a very short time, you could, Excellency, give us a clear idea about the Middle East and what is going on in the Middle East. Here, I would like to ask you personally, Excellency, about the Arab Spring. Is real Arab Spring in your point of view? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmad. Yani, I think uh, Arab Spring is uh, not Arab, Arab word. It's been used from the West. They were hoping that this uprising will end with a nice spring. But as you see from the presentation, in that period, there was global uprising, not only in Tunisia and Arab world. It was in New York, in Wall Street, it was in London, fire and, you know, it was in Paris, it was in Spain. For that, what we are saying that this is uprising against what's happening. A globaliz a globalization affected economics and created inequality because our rules are not made for a global, a global world. Each, each, each country has its own rules to run economics. For that, the major companies, they had the chance to escape like from taxation, okay? That's just example where the issue is inequality. That's the, all what's happening now, what you're seeing in the United States, you're seeing in Britain, you are seeing in Europe, it's related, people are suffering. And they are angry. Why they are running after Trump? Not because they like him. Because they are angry. They want to express their anger. Because people have to do three jobs to keep their family surviving. Students, they have to go and take loans to get, you know, to study. And when they, get, they finish their education, they don't get a job. And they have a huge loan to pay till they, till they die. For that, the situation is very bad. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Next question, please. Gabbard. Gabbard Hilscher, a freelance from Germany. I would, if you can find a way to uh, overcome the diplomatic considerations, ask you uh, where do you see or how do you see a solution to the problem what Israel and the Palestinians should do to create something for the future? You know, this is my personal opinion. First thing, I think the Jewish people were victim. In the slide you've seen, the Jewish people, they didn't want a place where there is population. They said all the time, uh, people for a land in a land with no people and if you saw that uh, slide I showed you when that uh, Dr. Rothenstein wrote to the British Empire they asked for a place where it's empty to develop their states they didn't ask for uh, Palestine but Belfort he had another ideas remember the British Empire suffered from Islamic Empire. We said before in this history, Islamic Empire, between Islamic Empire and uh, Ottoman Empire, it was 1,500 years, okay? And this didn't end except by World War I. For that, when they started to decide what to do with the region, for them it was very important that Islamic Empire didn't rise again. That's why Bill Ford thought the best thing to bring the Jewish people in Palestine for two, at least two reasons. The first thing, 
They wanted to protect the Suez Canal from Ottoman Empire fighters. The second, they thought they want some sort of Western system within the heart of the region. That was, that's the way he thought. But as you see, after 100 years, it was a disaster. And there's a word from Bismarck friend, Von Ron. He said very important say. He said, nobody uh, eat from the tree of Marty with immunity. And he was talking about Bismarck. Bismarck worked hard to, do, you know, to unite Germany, but at the same time, he planted the root for German destruction in World War I and World War II. For that, that's what happened with Belfort. He worked hard 100 years ago, but the end, what do, you see, what do you see in the Middle East now? What is the situation? For that, this is very important. If you are a diplomat, work with morality, because you cannot have immunity by eating from the tree of immorality. Thank you, sir. For your question. Uh, freelance, Takashi Kwama. Nice to see you again. Uh, there's a tendency to blame the present situation in the Middle East on Sykes Pico. Do you agree to that? Absolutely no. You cannot blame anybody. History is history. When people make decision, they make it, uh, you know, when they did this decision 100 years ago, they did it because they thought. The first thing is that how to prevent something like Ottoman Empire to start again. Second thing, that area just was just a land, Ottoman Empire. There were no states. For that, Sykes Pico created a state, it created a modern state. The question, did they do it properly? Again, it's, it's, you know, it's easy for you after 100 years you ask is it properly or not because you project what happened after 100 years. But the people who did it before 100 years, their thinking was different. For that, blaming doesn't work. We just have to learn from the history and avoid what we think might be there, they were mistakes. Thank you for your question, sir. Yes. Thank you, Excellency. Really, it's a very important lecture. Uh, you have raised the no, uh, I'm uh, charge of affair of Syrian Arab Republic. So I, even though I might not agree with some elements, especially the last question relating to Sykes-Pico agreement, I would say uh, definitely it is very important to think how we can learn from the history and how can we avoid the difficulties. But the, uh, what we are facing that it is the beginning from that time and do, uh, we still facing the same interference. So the, the problem which we have, it is not only internally problem. We are uh, facing in our region from the consequences of uh, the economic uh, problems and other problems, as others are facing. But the problems which we are facing right now, it is because of the interfering. I mean, imposing or promoting certain kind of democracy, which is appropriate for Western countries or for the US, and not fitting our people and our history, this is a big problem. We have seen in Afghanistan, uh, we have seen in, in uh, Iraq occupation, we have seen in Libya, and right now, right now in Syria. So it is intentionally interfering in our internal affairs in order to achieve their own agenda. So uh, addressing now the, the title of 
the lecture, the future of uh, the Middle East. If we keep silent, and if we only watching these certain powers, at, uh, trying to achieve their own agenda, it will be miserable. The, the place will be only uh, very good for these terrorist groups to stay and achieve what they want. Actually, they are not Islam, and this is not Arab Spring. So the idea is, what about your thinking? What about to follow only the, the, the main principles of the UN charters. So respecting all state, not interfering in any internal affairs, and leave the people to decide their own future. Thank you. I completely agree with you. The first thing, you know, Sykes Biko, Sykes Biko creates problems like, where are the resources they put it in small countries. Okay, you saw the, uh, the GDP gap in the Middle East. Okay? The Sykes Biko, where is a lot of oil, put it in small country. Because these countries are made all after World War uh, I. Okay? Why they did this? Because if that country is small, they don't have power. They can run the country they, wa they, wa they, wa they want. The resources can be run the way. And again, another example, as uh, uh, Her Excellency mentioned, Iran. The, the Iran was a democracy. And there was a prime minister being elected, Mossadegh. Who got rid of Mossadegh? OK. And what happened after getting rid of Mossadegh? Shah comes with a dictatorship. And what happened after that? We came with theocracy. For that, I completely agree with you. And this is what Jeffrey Sachs said, and we put it on a slide, that this interference should be stopped after 100 years. And thank you for your question. Thanks. Uh, yes, please. <coughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Marina, and I'm a student member here at the FCCJ. I have a question about the information democratization that you mentioned early on in the presentation. Um, in your opinion, uh, how have the arrests of human rights activists, uh, including of Mr. Najib Kabab, Kajab, uh, affected how uh, Bahrain is perceived as a nation, and how would that affect the foreign policy of the country? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Now, there's no time enough to discuss Bahrain, but uh, you know we are a small country, and we we'll, uh, we are very small. We are <laughs> we are only 760 square kilometers, and we are 1.3 million population. No, only 730 kilometers. Okay, we are 100 meters. Okay, <laughs> we are very small, but very strategic, and many uh, small islands. But it's a very beautiful place, Yani. Very organized. We inherit a lot of good things from the British. Um, let me say a few things about my country because I'm from Bahrain. Yani we inherited from uh, the British discipline, organization. We have good health care. We have good nursing care. We have good education. We have good uh, traffic system. We, uh, you know, in the university we have, in Arabian Gulf University, we have problem-based learning education. The uh, person, the student ran and ran through learn through problems, okay? At the same time, the student is active learner. They said the student sit and look at the problem, and they find, they go and look for answer for the problem, and they come, and they do the presentation. That's what we call active learning. For that, and Bahrain is a beautiful island, and uh, advanced technology, you can do all your work through the inter inter uh, internet. Anything you want to do, you can finish it through internet. Getting a license, pay, paying your, you know, fee, uh, bills and so and so. And Bahrain is a financial center. 
And Bahrain called Bahrain because in Arabic Bahrain means two seas. Why is being called two seas? You know, we are surrounded by uh, sea, but at the same time, we had, uh, we had a lot of fresh water. Until the Middle Sea, we had spring of fresh water. This created a good environment for natural pairs. For that, I can, our economy depended on jewelry. Till now, in November, we have a huge jewelry exhibition. All the designers the, around the world, they come. But later on, on when Mikumoto, uh, you know, invented cultural pair, that affected our economy. But fortunately, we produced oil in 1932. And we shipped oil to Japan in 1934. For that, this, anyhow, now Bahrain is a place, you know, it's a financial center in the Middle East. We have different type of manufacturing industry, aluminum, petrochemical, um, uh, steel. Now, Bahrain is a small country. And we are sandwiched between many places. But we have one thing good. We have the fifth fleet of the United States in Bahrain. For that, we are secured. And we have free trade agreement with the United States. For that, our law should abide by many laws of the United States. One of our problem was Iranian revolution. Now, the Iranian revolution came and uh, people were happy because we in Bahrain, we are a liberal country. And we are happy that there will be democracy, there will be this and that. And at the end, we ended with theocracy. The man who leads that country is a religious leader. Okay? And what? In, in the 21st century, unfortunately, these people have some influence in Bahrain because of the issue of the religion, the Shia and Sunnah. For that, you know, I was a minister of health when I was in government. Before I, you know, before I became a minister, I was elected president of the medical association. And I been selected because I was elected, you know, uh, President of the Medical Association decided that I become a Minister of Health. And I remember very well at that time, 2001-2002, we were trying to work with Iran. We were trying to buy gas from Iran. We were trying to buy crude oil from Iran and we process it. We have a good petrochemical industry. But as you see, in Iran, there's so many problems. Now, until Rouhani came, he wanted to reform. Khatami came, wanted to reform. Rafsanjani came to, be, came to reform. But it's extreme on the right, with national, uh, with revolution guard. That's what's obstructing. Unfortunately, these people are affecting, again, our situation in Bahrain. What you call Hezbollah, again have influence in Bahrain. These are our challenges, you know. And it's not easy for us to solve. We are very small, okay? For that, yani, that's what I can tell you. Thank you Thank for you. your question. Tom, and you next. Tom. Uh, Thomas Sullivan, Associate Member, Ambassador Hassan. It's good to see you again. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you just quickly about the position of the of the of the Western uh, allies. For example, it seems to me to be a little bit confusing. For example, in Iraq uh, at the moment, they seem to be supporting a Shia-led government, which is backed by Iran, uh, attacking you know uh, uh, Sunni uh, extremists in, in Mosul, for instance, at the moment. And in Syria, they seem to be backing uh, or fighting against uh, a Shia-led leader um, who's also supported by Russia so I was just wondering if you could you know if you um, understand that situation and again just with regard to Syria obviously it's been described as the worst humanitarian crisis since World War two um, it looks to with you know 400,000 people killed it looks to me like uh, President Assad is is winning that do you would you agree with with my assessment uh, that civil war thank you thank you very much sir 
I think a very excellent question. Please remember, you know, Islam started around six, you know, uh, let's say a few words about Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad was just ordinary man. And he married to a businesswoman. And she trusted this guy. For that, he was working in business. But suddenly, around 620, if I remember well, he felt he has a responsibility for a message from God. And he spent from 600, 10, I think, to 620, trying to spread this message of God. By 620, after the, yani, at that time when he started on this issue, he was 40 years of age. 10 years he spent it to convince people about his message. But he been abused and so many things happened. After 10 years, he was in stroke position. And he managed to spread Islam in the, his region, which is mainly between Medina and Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia now. Okay? When he passed away, okay, what happened? Islam changed to something different because it became, became like rising empire. It became about wealth, about power, about dynasty, about empire. Okay? And in this period where this question of Shia and Sunnah, what is Shia and Sunnah? One say, I should have the government. The other say, I should have the government. When it say, I should have government because I am a relative of Muhammad. The other one say, I should have the uh, uh, government because people are supporting me. For that, this is really, I, what I want to say, the, what is Shia and Sunnah is really economics. What is happening in Iraq now or in Syria, it's related to issue of economics, you know? And we mentioned before, you, I showed you a slide about this terror and so and so and these people, IS, IS, and all this result, to be honest, if these people are, there was some equality, if they had proper education, if they had jobs, you didn't have this all mess. All dismissed because there is hopelessness in the Middle East. That's what caused all this issue. For that, the situation is completely confusing. You know? <laughs> you know, for everybody it's confusing what is happening. And most of the people who are fighting, they are not in Syria or in Iraq. Most of them not from the region. They came from some other places. And this is the mess. That's why it's so complicated, and nobody knows who is who. That's why I can I say thank you, sir, for your question. My name is Inoue. I'm freelance. Um, I would like to ask about the uh, relationship between Iran and Turkey. Uh, obviously two regional rivals trying to implement opposing views, opposing visions in the region. But, and one is Sunni and the other is Shia. And, but they are now trying to improve the relationship with top officials meeting regularly in their respective capitals. How do you see this improvement of the relationship these two countries? And do you think this could somehow eventually lead to a solution in these Middle East problems? Now, uh, please remember, uh, the days of Shah, Shah was Shia, but Shah had a good relation with the Gulf region, okay? And uh, most of the Gulf uh, region are Sunnah. 
for the, I repeat, it's not an issue of Sunnah or Shia. Please remember this. Going back to Turkey and Iran, it has nothing to do with religion or with the Shia and Sunnah. It has to do with the strategy of each of these countries. What they want to achieve, how they maintain their power. This is the issue. Turkey have a big challenge. One of the Sykes Biko defect is, you know, the Kurds, they had a huge land. And Sykes Biko came and divided it and put each part of different country. For that, the Kurds, they lost all their rights. Now, one of the things the court they are trying to do is that they want their rights back. How they want it? Now, some they say within uh, the country they are in, some they say, no, we want our Turkestan, we want our states. And that's risky for Iran and for Turkey. Because that means part of Turkey will go to Kurdistan, part of Iran will go to Kurdistan, part of Syria maybe, part of Iraq. But this is a big challenge, one of the big challenges here. I go back to the question, you know, Turkey and Iran, it has nothing to do with religion. Again, we are hopeful that there will be some changes in Iran. Because the leader who is Ayatollah, he's very old and he has cancer. Okay? And they are not expecting he will live long. If he pass away and the reformists take over, Iran will be different, I think. Because everybody, uh, Iranians, they suffered. Iran is a huge civilization. You saw one of the first civilization was the Persian civilization in the Middle East. And they are very modern. They are very liberal. What they are suffering from, theocracy doesn't fit the Iranian people. For that, I am optimistic. Iran will change. And uh, I'm sure Turkey again has to change. Evolution, you cannot stop evolution. Thank you for your question. Thanks. I think we are approaching the end, but uh, if I may. John, please, go ahead. Cannot say not. Uh, my name is Joan Anderson from Soka Gakkai International. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is um, about the role of women in the Middle East and how you think women, younger women, especially with the, the demographics being the way they are, how they can maybe play an increasing role in creating a new future. And the second question is how you, I think all of us are very ignorant about the Middle East. But I, th I feel j that there is a particular problem in Japan that people see the Middle East just as a problem area. And do you have any plans to go on a speaking tour of Japan and <laughs> educate people? <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Now, you know, um, in Bahrain, education of women started early. At almost the same time when women or men started the education. The top students in the, you know, in the secondary school, they are usually women. That's why they get the best colleges. Men are the second grade, in, you know, because they really work hard. And miss, most probably most of the Arab world. Yes, there are challenges for women in the Middle East. In Bahrain, we have ministers, we have ambassadors, we have uh, big banker, a businesswoman, uh, yani it's more liberal. But I think, again, there are things like, for example, we want, you know, what you call this, uh, you know, before they depended on Sharia for personal law. What do you call it? Personal law. Okay, yani for uh, personal life issues, they were depending on Sharia. But in Bahrain, we decided no. We should have proper laws for everybody out of this. And uh, included that human, uh, women have 
the same right. Half of this part of law passed, uh, which is really related to the Sunni sect. But the Shia sect, opposed by these ayatollahs, they blocked it. But now we are trying that it will pass. This is just an example that if this law pass, there will be equality between men and women. Uh, yes, there are challenges for women in the Middle East, uh, but not what you hear. Because Middle East is a huge area. But what you hear is part of a small area where this and this and this. For that, uh, uh, it, yes, again, uh, Japanese have to know more about the Middle East. Because where is the problem is very limited place. Uh, the problem is far, far away from Bahrain, and we are in the Gulf region. For imagine from Egypt, from Tunisia, from Morocco, it's quite far. For that, but the news again these days can excite things, you know, make it more visible. But I hope we can. And I'm sure I'm optimistic Middle East will change. You know. <clears throat> uh, like, you know, what happened, as I said, World War, after World War II. There was complete destruction. But the United States decided to support Europe. And what happened? When they supported Europe and Europe prospered and starts using and producing so on, United States prospered. And the uh, United States became number one in the world economics, uh, from economic side. For that, there are same opportunity, the um, global economy is weak and the growth is slow. But if we develop that region, all the world economy will grow. The minute somewhere uh, prosper, there will be a lot of being bought, a lot being sold, industry will work, so many things will happen. And I'm optimistic. Thank you for your question. Thanks. Uh, I cannot let this session go without asking this question. You are a doctor <laughs> and you are an ambassador. So how can you apply the medical knowledge and diplomacy? <laughs> like if you give advice or You know, I had wisdom. two shocks in my life. The first was, you know, we were a uh, British colony. And, you know, when the first time I went to London, and I saw a British guy, you know, carrying the bag, I was so shocked. How come a British carry the bag? It was a big shock for me. When I came to Japan, again, it was my second shock. When I watched what's going in Japan, and I said, how come they are Orient, they are Asian, how can they so develop? You know, it was an interesting experience for me. I was a busy surgeon. I start early in the morning, which everything is dark, and go back home when everything is dark. You know, I, I'm specialized in baby surgery. When the baby born needs surgery, I have to work on the surgery. And usually, these are a newborn, just born, and they have urgent things. But it was very, very busy life. And after that came the issue of being a minister of health. Imagine, if you want to imagine this, imagine how much Obamacare suffered, how much Obama suffered from Obamacare. If you want to uh, reform healthcare, it's a very difficult thing to do. Anytime, uh, anyhow, after that they sent me in Japan. I, I say usually, you know, in the Middle East we say, when somebody do good things and die, he goes to heaven. And I tell people, you know, <laughs> it looks I've been a pediatric surgeon. Before I die, they brought me to heaven, to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to Japan. For me, diplomacy is very beautiful, yani, very beautiful profession. But at the same time, I feel sorry for the diplomat because they have all the time to move from one place to another and their families and so on. So, but it's very, very interesting. I enjoyed my life between everything in my life I did, very exciting. I enjoyed and I, you know, I was happy in my life. 
for the everything I'm enjoying and this experience very rich. I'm coming here to your club. I learn a lot. You know, I learn really. It was enriched me a lot. And thank you very much. Thank you and welcome always to our club. And I understand you say that global politics needs a desperate surgery, maybe. <laughs> so our world become more peaceful. And um, so uh, let me give you a, a special uh, gift. You are you already member, so usually we give honorary membership. But today I will give you a special gift. It's a special tea selected by our club. So please enjoy this tea at, at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming and have a nice evening. Thanks.